Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and uh, so far in the previous lecture we have discussed about the basic principle of ion exchange chromatography and in addition we have also discussed about uh, the how to perform the ion, generalized ion exchange chromatography, what are the different steps you have to uh, take uh, to successfully complete the chromatography and how to choose the different types of matrix and what is the importance of isoelectric point and as well as the other parameters which you have to consider while you select the, uh, the uh, a suitable matrix for protein purifications. In addition, we have also briefly discussed about the uh, several applications of the ion exchange chromatography for the industrial usage as well as for the daily uses. So, in that context, we have also discussed about the protein uh, water purifications, how the ion exchange chromatography can be used to purify the different components of the water so that the water will be free of the uh, salt and the heavy metals and fluoride and all other kinds of contaminants. So, now to in today's lecture, we are going to discuss about the uh, how uh, ion exchange chromatography can be utilized to solve the different types of research problems. So, uh, one of the major application or the utilization of ion exchange chromatography is to purify the or to process the complex protein mixture and from there you can be able to select the protein of your interest simply using the ion exchange chromatography. So, we will go through with the uh, several examples how you can process the samples and what are different precautions you have to take so that it will give you an idea uh, about optimizing the protein purifications of your own choice and as well as it may give you the idea how to perform the chromatography if you have the similar kind of samples. So, in this case uh, I have taken the first examples where we are going to purify or we are going to learn how to purify the protein from the plant sources. So, the first example is that where we are planning to purify the proteins from the plant sources and for this example we have taken a plant which is called as Nigelia sativa. So, in the first step itself you have to perform the extraction. Uh, so, in the extraction procedures you have the different uh, uh, systematic scheme uh, where you have to first make a watery extract of the plant and then you dry and keep the powder and then you can take the suitable amount of powder and dissolve it into a PBS at PS 6.4. Now, once you dissolve this into PBS, you are going to get and when you vigorously mix this uh, solution along with the PBS, you are going to get 3 fractions. In the fraction number 1, you are going to get the insoluble pellet, the pellet which is not going to be, which is going to settle down uh, after you making the powder, uh, dissolving the powder in the PBS. The second is there will be a oily layer which is present on the top and then you have a soluble extract which is the fraction number 3. So, uh, once you uh, have uh, dissolved this powder into PBS, you vigorously mix the powder, then carefully first you remove the oily layer from the top with the help of the pipette and then you spin this mixture and that actually is going to give you the insoluble pellet as well as the soluble extract. This soluble extract can be dialyzed against the 50 millimolar phosphate buffer PS 6.4 and using a 3500 molecular cutoff dialysis bags. So, the dialysis membrane what you have to use in this case is going to be of 3500 uh, Dalton uh, molecular weight cutoff. Once you are done with this, you, uh, you can estimate the protein because you know that the every column has the uh, a suitable binding capacity. So, you, you cannot load more than what is the binding capacity of a column. So, you have to estimate the protein using the Bradford method and once you have know that uh, you have the 
uh, sufficient quantity of the protein, then you can take this and use it in the chromatography. So, the chromatography uh, will be done with the help of the uh, by packing a uh, station, uh, packing the matrix into the column. So, in this case, we are using the DA Cephadex A50. So, DA Cephadex, if you remember, it is a an ion exchange chromatography matrix. So, uh, once the protein is bound, then you can do the washing step and after the washing, you can elute this with a NaCl gradient in 50 millimolar phosphate PS6.4 and whatever is coming out from the column can be detected by the uh, spectrophotometric method by uh, measuring the ODs at uh, uh, 280 nanometer and that actually will give you the chromatogram to know at in what fractions you have the proteins and then subsequently what you can do is you can analyze these fraction in a SDS page and that actually will give you the protein bands of the different molecular weight. Now, depending on what what is your choice or what is your uh, protein of interest, you can be able to refine and fine tune these uh, uh, protocol and as well as you can be able to get the desirable proteins in a very, very high quantities. Now, in the next uh, we are next uh, examples, we are going to uh, purify the carbohydrates from the plant sources. So, for this what we want to do is we want to do the purification of the carbohydrate from the plants. Uh, for this we have taken an example of Olea europhia and the steps are remain the same. You have to first do uh, extraction procedures. For the extraction you have to follow a particular scheme. So, what you have to do is you have to first take the uh, leaves as well as the root of this plant and then you have to first prepare the water extract. Uh, the only uh, advice or the caution is that the leaf or the root whatever you take should not be taken from the very old plant. So, it should be very uh, two, uh, up to the two year old plant and then what you do is you extract the watery extract with the D30 methyl glucoside uh, uh, by and you extract it for the 15 minutes. After that you are going to get two fractions, you are going to get the insoluble pellet as well as the soluble extract. Now the soluble extract you can just pass through through a guard column so that it should remove the impurities because as you remember. Uh, we have while we were discussing about the preparation of the samples, it was very much advisable that you should not have the particulate matters, uh, especially in this case where we have to use the uh, God column so that the it, you you will remove all the uh, all the contaminants uh, so that it should not interfere in the subsequent steps. After that, you can do the chromatography. So in this case, we are using the uh, not only one column, but the two columns. So, uh, you can use the two anion exchange columns. One is called Dionyx uh, Carbapec P1 and the other one is called as the Carbapec M1 column. Both are the HPLC anion exchange columns and the elution. So, what you have to do is first you load the, uh, the soluble extract. Uh, which you have passed through to the guard column first to the this column and then you do the elution with the help of the 12 millimolar NEH containing 1 millimolar barium acetate. And once you got the, uh, the fractions, those fractions can be loaded onto the next column and that is how you can be able to fine tune the purifications. The detection can be done with the help of the pulse areometric detections and that actually is going to detect the carbohydrates and ultimately you are going to get all the carbohydrates whatever is present in this particular plant and depending on the, uh, the choice of your carbohydrate which you are interested to purify, you can be able to fine tune the purifications with the changing the changing in the uh, gradient curves as well as the changing the uh, pH of the solution and as well uh, all other parameters and that is how you can be able to achieve the purification of the carbohydrate from the plants. 
Now the third example is because so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the plants. Now we'll discuss about the animal cells. So we'll discuss how you can be able to isolate the protein from the animal source. For this examples, we have taken the examples of the hen egg. So uh, the our objective is to purify the protein from the animal source. We have taken an example of hen egg. And the first step as it is that we have to follow an extraction procedure. So in the extraction procedure, what we have to do is we have to first collect the uh, fresh egg and then we have to break open the egg, we have to remove the yolk part. So the re so first part is that you have to remove the yolk part, you have to just take the white egg white and then you have to do the isoelectric precipitation of the egg white with the help of the 100 millimolar NaCl. Once you do that, you are going to get two fractions in the fraction 1 supernatant which contains uh, ovomyosin uh, and you are going to get the precipitate. This precipitate you can further dissolve into 500 millimolar NaCl with the stirring at 4 degree for overnight. So once you dissolve this precipitate into 500 millimolar NaCl with stirring at 4 degree, uh, it will again give you the uh, two fractions. The fraction number one is the precipitate which you are going to discard and then you are going to get the supernatant. The supernatant, so the supernatant 2 as well as the supernatant 1 is going to pull together because this will contain the protein, uh, especially the ovomucin and this one is going to contain all other proteins which are uh, be part of the uh, egg white and then you pull these two, uh, so you pull the supernatant 1, you pull the supernatant 2 and then you use them uh, into the chromatography. For the chromatography in this case because we have to fractionate the uh, all the proteins present in the egg white, we have using the two column, one is called as the q sephiros fast, fa uh, uh, fast flow which is the anion exchange chromatography column and then you are using the sp sephiros fast flow uh, which is a cation exchange chromatography. So in this what you are going to do, first you are going to load the sample onto the q sephiros fast flow and then you are going to uh, elude the sample with the isocritic elution of the sample using the 0.14 molar NaCl. Following this, you are actually going to do the gradient elutions uh, with the help of 0.14, 2.5 molar of NaCl in the case of an ion exchange chromatography. So that actually is going to give you the different fractions. Uh, fractions uh, containing uh, proteins and the unbound fractions. So what will happen is once you load the uh, sample onto a q sephiros fast flow and you will going to do the elution profile, you are, some of the protein is going to bind, the sum of the protein is not going to bind. The unbound fraction whatever is going to, you are going to get from the q sephiros is going to be loaded onto the cation exchange chromatography which is the sp sephiros chromatography and then you have to follow the similar elution schemes which means you are going to first do the isocratic elution of the sample using 0.14 molar NaCl and then you have to do a gradient elution from the 0.14 to 0.5 molar and ultimately you are going to use the mass spectrometry as a detector to detect the masses of the protein whatever is coming from the either the anion exchange column or the cation exchange columns and ultimately you are going to detect the different proteins like ova albumin, ova transferrin, lysozymes and ovomucin. And because all these proteins are of different molecular weight, so you will be able to detect them while they are coming from the elutions. So these are the research problems where we are using or we are uh, using the ion exchange chromatography 
to only pedify the particular proteins. You can be able to have the multiple such examples, uh, but overall what you have to do is you have to clarify the samples, you have to do an extraction procedure so that your recovery of your protein from these samples should be as high as possible and then ultimately you also have to perform the ion exchange chromatography either the anion exchange chromatography or the cation exchange chromatography or in some cases we have taken an example where you are using the combinations of the anion as well as the cation exchange chromatography to purify the many factors from the single source. Now what we are going to discuss, we are going to discuss about the research problems where you can be able to utilize the ion exchange chrom chromatography. So this is the problem 1. The problem 1 is that the scientists have discovered a transcription factor in skin cells binds to the set of gene X which is responsible for changing its color due to the exposure to sunlight. Now, what they want? They want to identify the transcription factor from the skin cells. So what is the problem? Problem is that the scientists have uh, speculated that there, there are transcription factors which are actually binding to set of genes or set of gene X. By doing so, it is actually changing the downstream expression profiling in such a way that it is actually changing the color of the skin. So now before going into the solution of this problem, what you have to understand is the what is the design of a particular gene and what is the function of a transcription factor. So a particular coding gene in a mammalian cells is containing different component. For example, it contains a promoter then it contains the exon or the introns together this region is called as the coding region. So these are the only region which we are interested to discuss. Now this is the region which actually gives the protein part and whereas this is the region which is actually playing the role of the regulatory role which means the expression of this particular protein is going to be regulated by the promoter because the promoter is going to bind the transcription factors and by doing the trans by binding of the transcription factor to the specific promoters which are associate which are bound or which are present ne to the uh, next to the uh, gene it actually regulates the expression. But what are the transcription factors? The transcription factors are the, the proteins which are actually binding to the DNA and that is how they are actually modulating the gene expressions. What you have to understand here is that they are not binding to the DNA but they are only binding to the promoter regions. So to solve this problem or to under to uh, to uh, decipher the uh, whole equations or to identify the transcription factor, what you have to do is because DNA is negatively charged and the transcription factor has the positive charge region because of that the transcription factor as well as the promoter is binding through uh, uh, the electrostatic interactions and so you can be able to purify or exploit this phenomena which means if you want to do this you will need a promoter means promoter of this particular gene and what you need is you need a source from where you are going to get the transcription factors. So in this case the promoter is anyway belonging to the gene X and the transcription factors you are going to get from the skin cells. Okay? So what you have to do is you have to first break open the skin cells, you have to recover the mixture of transcription factors and then you have to also clone the promoter of this particular gene so that you are going to have the multiple copies of these promoters. Then what you are supposed to do? 
you have to design an experiment so that you will be able to control all the parameters so that you will not be able to get the false positives. So, in this case what you are going to do is you are so in the experimental design what I will what we will do we will take the DNA we will bind it to the anion exchange column because the DNA is negatively charged. So, it will bind to the anion exchange columns and then what we will do is we will take up this transcription factor and allow them to glow ok and we will choose the pH in such a way so that the p uh, the protein x what or the transcription factor what you are taking is going to be containing no charge which means it will not bind to the column on its own. Then what you do is you wash this with the uh, cuotropic or uh, wash with the uh, salt and then elute it with the salt. So, what will happen when you elute it with the salt the DNA as well as the transcription factor is going to be eluted. Then what you do is you take this transcription take the eluents and analyze it onto the SDS page as well as the agarose page. So, agarose is going to give you the pattern for the promoters whereas, this one is going to give you the, uh, the pattern for the transcription factors. Now, the transcription factor there will be multiple transcription factors which are going to be present in your lysate. So, if the transcription factor will bind to the, to the DNA or if a particular set of fractions are going to give you the binding then they, the, elution, the, the pattern of these proteins onto the SDS page is going to match with the pattern of the promoters ok. So, in this approach the anion exchange column is incubated with the DNA and allowed it to the bind tightly. Now, the transcription factor is passed through to the DNA bound to the beads followed by the washing with the buffer to remove the unbound pro the transcription factors. Now, the DNA is eluted from the matrix either by adding the high salt or with denaturating conditions either of these conditions. Now, what you are going to get? You are going to get the different fractions which you can test on the SDS page as well as the uh, agarose and that eventually will give you the pattern that pattern is going to match if they are actually binding to the promoter region of that particular gene. As a control you can also run the glycate onto the empty column without the DNA. So, whatever the transcription factor will bind to the beads and will come through into the, uh, the elution profile those are the transcription factor you can easily ignore because it is not that the transcription factor is only bind the other protein will also going to bind to the DNA. For example, the single standard DNA binding proteins or helicases or rep DNA polymerase these are the proteins also will have a very high affinity for your promoters or probably a small stretch of DNA. So, those proteins are also going to bind, but they will not going to show you a pattern because their binding is going to be non-specific they will bind uh, to every region of the, uh, the to the DNA whereas, the transcription factor is going to have a specific affinity and they are also they are only going to bind to the particular DNA. So, to execute this D, these experiments you need to perform four things. What you have to do first you have to clone the, the promoter of that gene X then you have to do the ion exchange chromatography which means in this case you have to do uh, an ion exchange chromatography. Then you have to do the agarose gel electrophoresis to see the pattern of the promoter DNA and you also have to do the SDS page to see the pattern of the transcription factors and ultimately by doing this experiment you will be able to identify a particular transcription factors. If you fine tune the purifications you will be able to or if you add some more purification uh, uh, tools for example, if I if you use the gel filtration or affinity chromatography you will be able to remove the uh, outliers and that is how you will be able to identify the particular transcription factor utilizing this approach.
Now let's go move on to the next problem. And in the next problems, the problem 2 is that the cancer cells are treated with carcumin. So carcumin is a drug or carcumin is actually a phytochemical which is present in the uh, in the turmeric. So, but carcumin is a very very well known anti cancer compound and it activates the several protein kinases in the cell lysate. Now, a PhD student wants to measure the total kinase activity of the cell lysate, which means the objective is that the, the particular student wants to measure the kinase activity which is present in the cell lysate. Now, what you have? You have the cell lysate which contains the different type of protein kinases and what these protein kinases are doing? They are actually converting the substrate to the uh, with the help of the ATP to a substrate phosphorylated substrates which means they are actually generating the negatively charged molecules or negatively charged substrates. So, in this case what you can do is you can easily perform the ion exchange chromatography to purify the uh, this uh, negatively charged or phosphorylated uh, substrate and then you can be able to uh, measure the kinase activity of the cell lysate. Now, what you have to do is, so what is the experimental design is that you take the substrate, okay, you ready build the substrate with the help of the carbon 14, okay, so that actually is going to make this substrate detectable with the help of the uh, radiography. Then you incubate it with the ATP, so what will happen? The protein kinases which are present in the lysate is going to phosphorylate and they are going to give you a negative charge and in addition it is going to generate the ADP. Now what you do is you take this complete assay mixture and load it onto uh, uh, the ion exchange column. So in this case we are taking the ion exchange column uh, like the cation exchange column. Okay. So what will happen? The cation exchange column is going to bind everything except the negatively charged the substrate which means you are going to, when you load the protein when you load this experimental assay system it will bind everything except the phosphorylated substrates which means and in addition it is also going to release the cold ATP and cold ADP but cold ATP is hardly matters because what you are going to measure is the radioactivity associated with the carbon 14. So carbon 14 which is non phosphorylated is going to be trapped onto the column itself whereas the phosphorylated carbon 14 a phosphorylated substrate is going to be released from the column in the form of flow through and then you can take up the flow through and measure the radioactivity. Ultimately, you can also do a elution with the salt and you can be able to measure the radioactivity to confirm that the, uh, the column has trapped the uh, radioactivity. As a control, you can also do a control reaction where you can do everything but your you can remove the kinase from the reaction. So if you do a removal of kinase, whatever you are going to get the counts these are going to be the basal level counts and these counts are going to be uh, subtracted from your experimental counts. So for this particular experiment to perform this experiment you have to perform the you have to prepare the cell lysate then you have to incubate the cell lysate with the radio labeled carbon 14 substrate and then you also have to add it to the ATP and incubate it for some time and then you have to perform the ion exchange chromatography. Well, after this ion exchange chromatography whatever the flow through you are going to get that flow through can be analyzed in two different ways to get more and more different informations. So what you can do is this you can analyze in two different way. One you can easily collect 
the uh, you can uh, take up the fractions and uh, you can do the flow through and you can collect the radioactive counts and that so you can collect the radioactive count in the scintillation counter and that actually is going to give you the kinase activity associated with the uh, cell lysate. On the other hand, you can also analyze these flow through into a SDS page and SDS page followed by the, uh, the identification of the substrates. So, if you do the SDS page and then you uh, further you do the uh, autoradiogram or if you do the western blotting, you can be able to even identify the substrates. So, we started with a single experiment, but that single experiment can be diverged in a multiple experiment and that is how you can be able to get two different informations like what is the kinase activity associated with the cell lysate and what are the different substrates which are present or which are going to be get phosphorylated by the these kinases. So, th these are this this by diverging the com uh, one single reactions, you can be able to get more and precise information about the experimental conditions. So, with this we would like to conclude our discussion about the ion exchange chromatography. What we have discussed? We have discussed about the basic principle of ion exchange chromatography. We have also discussed about the uh, the different uh, steps what you have to do and what are the, the crucial parameters you have to uh, consider when you would like to utilize them for uh, running the ion exchange chromatography and also uh, how the different parameters are crucial to uh, choose the specific matrix as well as the specific pH at which you have to perform the ion exchange chromatography and what are the different buffers which are available for cation exchange chromatography as well as the anion exchange chromatography. And in today's lecture, we have also discussed about the, uh, the potential of the ion exchange chromatography in the uh, solving different types of problems and how you can be able to use the ion exchange chromatography to purify the protein from the complex mixture. So, with this, I would like to conclude our lecture here. Thank you.